we have the Capital Investment Committee for March 25th is called to order. This remote hearing is taking place in accordance to House Rule 10.01 and is being live streamed by House Public Information Office. Mr. Lancheski, please take the roll. Members, you may unmute yourself when your name is called. Representative Foley. Lee, present. <coughs> Representative Foley, present. Representative Mary Murphy. Murphy, present. Representative Mary Murphy, present. Representative Dean Erdahl. Erdahl, present. Representative Dean Erdahl, present. Representative Esther Abaje. Representative Kayla Berg. Berg, present. Representative Kayla Berg, present. Representative Greg Davids. Davids, present. Representative Greg Davids, present. Representative Keith Frankie. Frankie, present. Representative Keith Frankie, present. Representative Mike Freiberg. Freiberg, present. Representative Mike Freiberg, present. Representative Rick Hansen. Present. Representative Rick Hansen, present. <coughs> Representative John Hewitt. Present. Representative John Hewitt, present. Representative Leon Lilly. Lilly, present. Representative Leon Lilly, present. Representative Eric Lucero. Ready to serve. Representative Eric Lucero, present. Representative Rena Moran. Present. Representative Rena Moran, present. Representative Nels Pearson. Pearson, present. Representative Nels Pearson, present. Representative Donald Raleigh. Raleigh, present. Representative Donald Raleigh, present. Representative Jordan Rasmussen. Rasmussen, present. Representative Jordan Rasmussen, present. Representative Liz Ryer. Ryer, present. Representative Liz Ryer, present. Representative Nolan West. Present, there we go. <laughs> Representative Nolan West, present. Representative Jay Zhang. Representative Esther Abaje. Present. Representative Esther Abaje, present. Representative Jay Zhang. Members, with the conclusion of the roll call, please mute your devices. A quorum is present. Thank you, Mr. Lenchewski. A quorum is present. Uh, Representative Murphy, do I have approval Mr. for the minutes Chair, for March 22nd? Mr. Chair, I move approval of the minutes for March 22nd as they were printed. Representative Murphy moves approval of the minutes for March 22nd. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the minutes for March 22nd is approved. Uh, members, we will continue having several uh, hearings on uh, bonding projects on an informational basis only. The bills have been allotted five minutes and one testifier for our members. Uh, today's bills focus on regional assets, public safety, and higher education. The first bill on the agenda is Representative Bonner's House File 933. Uh, welcome and please proceed. Is Representative Bonner on? I think she hasn't muted. Apologies. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair and members, uh, Maple Grove is a thriving community with a plethora of things going for it, including a community center that serves as the go-to place for seniors and pickleball, aqua aerobics and splashdown on the Grove Cove water slide, from basketball to birthday parties, banquets to bustling conferences, and sports tournaments to weddings. Uh, well, the area population has grown by 28% in the past 25 years since the community center opened. The visitors have become more diverse as a wide, ver or as become as diverse as the wide array of people it serves. From toddlers to teens to sports enthusiasts and seniors. As the services of Maple Grove Community Center have grown, so has the community it serves. Increasingly, we see that Maple Grove Community Center is becoming a gathering space for 650,000 visitors annually from around the region. 
and ever-growing needs of the surrounding community have fueled the need to expand and renovate and meet the vision of the future. Members, the ask in the bill before you is for 18 million for the bonding project um, and the expansion and renovation will include the critical cost saving measures to install energy efficient systems while renovating existing banquet and meeting spaces and expanding aquatic and athletic spaces. It will also serve the needs of age-friendly Maple Grove uh, through greater services for seniors and meet the citizens where they are by expanding access to food and housing supports for the community. The changing needs of our community and our region are all met in this microcosm of a diverse community. Uh, members, I want to thank you for your consideration and ask for your support for House File 933. And with that, Mr. Chair and members, I do have two distinguished guests with me today, uh, Mayor Mark Stephenson, uh, my testifier, and our City Administrator Heidi Nelson here, who is able to speak to any questions. Mayor Stephenson, please uh, identify yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, good morning, Chair Lee, Representative Bonner, and members of the committee. I am Mark Stephenson. I'm the mayor of Maple Grove. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you this morning about <clears throat> our capital request for the expansion and renovation of the Maple Grove Community Center. Uh, the Maple Grove Community Center opened to the public in 1997. Since that time, the population in the North Metro has grown to over 230,000 residents, and the diversity of Maple Grove has grown by over 13%. Annually, the community center welcomes over 650,000 regional visitors to its many attractions and services, including senior programs, a teen center, a farmer's market, banquet and meeting rooms, aquatic facilities, ice arenas, and a skate park. Its location in the heart of the Northwest Regional uh, Commercial Trade Area makes it a regional host for meetings, expos, tournaments for not only the Northwest Metro, but for the state of Minnesota. Maple Grove is a growing community and a changing community. Uh, the diversity in our schools and thus our community is growing. Um, over 56% of the students in the Osseo area school district are students of color. Our students, our services, our programs offered at the community center are valued by our diverse community. The expansion and renovation project will expand offerings for seniors, teens, as well as the general public for banquet and meeting rooms, aquatics, and the arts. The proje proposed project also includes a partnership with Veteran Services and the nonprofit Cross Services, which provides food, housing, and social services to the community. Additionally, a goal of the project will be to reduce the current carbon footprint of the facility, ensuring e energy efficiency and green construction principles throughout the expansion. This aligns with other recent projects initiated by the city for solar installations and energy efficient projects. We genuinely appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Chair Lee and Representative Bonner for this opportunity. Representative Erdogan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Bonner. Am I correct? The, the request is 18 million? Representative Bonner. Yes, Ms. Er, Representative Erdahl, that is correct. Representative um, Chair, uh, is, is there a, a local match? I mean, how much of, is, are the locals putting into this? Representative Bonner. Um, I will defer to Mayor Stephenson and, and um, Heidi Nelson uh, to give some greater detail on the city's portion. Mayor Stephenson. Uh, thank you, Chair Lee. Uh, there is a local portion uh, right now, the expected construction costs. Uh, we aren't completed, obviously, with the design concepts, but we're looking at probably about $100 million in actual costs for the entire facility. Last follow-up, okay. Representative Erdahl. No, thank you. Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Representative Bonner, for bringing this project to us today. I had a quick question. I, I was wondering, is this also a local option sales tax proposal, and, and how would that work? If so, how does that work with the bonding request, and, and what are your thoughts on uh, you know, potentially utilizing those different funding mechanisms? Representative Bonner. Uh, thank you for that. We do actually have a request for a local option sales tax as well, uh, which is uh, a half of a percent. Um, and that would work in tandem with this. And we're looking at multiple options here. Obviously, we want to make sure that the community 
uh, pays its fair share of, of expanding the facility. And of course it is located in Maple Grove, uh, but with the real diversity of individuals using the facility, in fact, in some cases over 50% uh, coming from outside of the community, we also wanted some options to help um, spread out the cost a little bit to some of those users. Um, and of course, make sure that we have the opportunity to um, use multiple avenues to also be responsible to our taxpayers um, and, and sort of spread out the cost. And if Absolutely. I've missed anything, um, uh, Ms. Nelson or uh, Mr. Mayor, please feel free to jump in. Representative Rasmussen, one last follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just, um, and thank you, Representative Bonner. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, different funding sources are going to be tapped for a, a project like this. Looks like a, a beautiful uh, facility. The, just to make sure I understand. So the the goal would be to try to get both a local option sales tax approved uh, for this project, in addition to bonding to make the the financing work. Am I characterizing that correctly, Representative Bonner? Representative Bonner. Yes, thank you for that, Representative Jordan. Uh, yes, you know, that we are looking at multiple options to make sure that we do this appropriately um, and that we're able to spread out the cost uh, amongst obviously our residents and of course those folks who are coming to uh, enjoy the facility. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Bonner. Representative Murphy. How many, Mr. Chair, Ms. Mayor Stephenson, how many um, buildings are we talking about? Uh, it's, it's conceived as one large building. Essentially, it's a very large building. I forget the exact square footage that we're looking at in the end, but uh, maybe um, Ms. Nelson would remember the exact square footage that this entire footprint would have. Ms. Nelson, please identify yourself and uh, proceed to answering the question. Thank you, Chair Lee. Uh, good morning. Heidi Nelson, Maple Grove City Administrator. The current square footage of the, field, the building is about 165,000 square feet. After renovation and expansion, it would be 250,000 square feet. Last follow up, Representative Murphy. That's it. Representative Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to point out that this is a, this is a regional um, asset here, this community center. I know it is used by people all over the metro area. I live a few cities over from Maple Grove, but uh, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of uh, amenities at the community center for residents of the whole metro area. I've brought my kids there to the Maple Maze, to the swimming pool. Um, so it's a great facility. So I think this is a good project. Just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Representative Freiberg. Uh, Representative Bonner, any quick closing comments? Uh, just thank you a lot for allowing us this opportunity to sort of showcase this incredible uh, regional asset. Um, and, you know, really, when we talk about multiple funding sources, we also want to make sure that we're being responsible to our community and the, the surrounding communities around us. We want to keep the facility affordable uh, so that everyone can continue to enjoy it for years to come. So thank you for your uh, indulgence today, and I hope that you will support House File 933. Thank you, Representative Bonner. Next up, we have Representative Senstad, House File 1823. Please proceed with your presentation. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present House File 1823. House File 1823 would invest $22 million for a new regional public safety center in the city of Hibbing for police and fire emergency medical services, emergency operations, and other regional community needs. The current facility was constructed in 1964 and is out of date and doesn't meet the needs of emergency personnel or the community. It faces a variety of deferred maintenance issues, including an aging roof and electrical system. While the city has done its very best to update the building, they face ADA compliance issues and other issues, like a lack of locker space for female officers. The police department currently rents space from St. Louis County, which isn't an ideal fit for the department and rent is becoming a large burden for city taxpayers. This proposal will help ensure citizens have the modern effective public safety infrastructure that they deserve. With me today, I have a testifier, Mayor Rick Kanata. Mayor Kanata, please identify Identify yourself for the record and proceed. Um, yes, hi, uh, this is Merrick Rick Kanata, Mayor of Hibbing. I actually, I'm using my city administrator's office right now. Um, I just stepped away from work. But uh, first of all, I wanna thank uh, 
Chair Lee and the committee members and represent Stansted for uh, letting us have a few minutes to bring up um, what we're looking for. Um, represent Stansted stated it pretty good about our building. Um, our, we're a regional, we're, the city of Hibbing is a central Italian range and um, we're actually 184 square miles. So we cover a big area. Um, we're diversified in our fire hall, like Representative Sansett said. Um, it's probably almost 50-50 female and male, and we have to expand. We have to build a new building. We're outdated. We were looking at getting a new ladder truck just this year. And to get our ladder truck that we want, we can't even fit it in the garage that we have, our fire hall right now. We would have to spend at least another two hundred fifty to 500000 to downsize our ladder truck. And like I said, we do mutual aid with many towns up here on the Iron Range. Um, we have Chisholm, Minnesota, which is five miles away. Kewatin, Minnesota, five miles away. Well, we're the one that has the ladder truck. Um, we have other communities around that are farther, but we, we take care of these other towns with our full-time fire department and paramedics. And like Represent Sandstead said, our building's aged. It's been 1976. Um, that's why we're here asking for help uh, to build a new building. Um, no matter what, we're gonna have to have to move ahead to build this building just because we don't have the locker space. Um, our fire department is full-time, 24 hours a day. and. Uh, and our police are right now in a county building, which we pay rent yearly to. So we're trying to be the best for our taxpayers. And that's why we're looking at building a brand new public safety building. And it is falling apart. It's, uh, it's a major thing. And uh, like I said, I appreciate the time, you know, giving us to talk to you. Um, we're open for questions, uh, committee members. Representative Erdahl. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I just want to make a comment. I mean, no doubt this is a very important project. Um, but but uh, I just want to offer a cautionary note. Uh, we, we have a lot of police and fire requests that, that come in or will come in. Uh, we did one, I think we're maybe more in the last bonded bill. but. We have our, across the state of Minnesota, all kinds of police and fire uh, buildings that may be needed by towns. So all I'm saying is, uh, as we look at these, uh, do it with a little bit of caution because we are going to get a lot of like-minded requests as we go along. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Erdahl. Uh, any closing comments, Representative Sense that? Thank you for the opportunity to present this bill to the committee um, and I would greatly appreciate your support. Thank you, Representative Sensa. Next up, we have Representative Cago, House File 926. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, House File 926 is a Greater Twin Cities Regional Public Safety Training Facility that would serve law enforcement, fire, and public works. Um, right now, there's limited local training options that currently exist in the North Metro. And um, the need for this type of facility in the North Metro was identified uh, by the Department of Public Safety in 2000 or yeah, 2009. The project has support from 21 public safety agencies in Anoka County, and the facility will serve the entire region for decades. Right now, the closest um, multidiscipline training area is in the south is the South Metro Public uh, Public Safety Training Center in Edina. And so, what this um, request is is for pre-design and design. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to the SBM Fire Chief uh, Charlie Smith. Uh, Chief Smith, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, good morning. My name is Charles Smith, Fire Chief of the SBM Fire Department. Thank you, Representative Cagle, uh, Mr. Chair, and committee members. My name is Charlie Smith, and I'm the Fire Chief for the Spring Lake Park Lane Moundsview Fire Department in Anoka County. Thank you very much for providing the opportunity to speak this morning on the Greater Twin Cities Regional Public Safety Training Area. In 2013, the concept of a multidiscipline training area located in Anoka County began to be discussed. With the demolition and dissolution of the Fridley Fire Training Area in 2017, the need for a training area became even more of a priority. The SPM Fire Department provides service for over 88,000 people and is rapidly growing, predicted to become over 100,000 permanent residents by 2040. This growth will come 
a significant growth for calls with service, uh, the need for additional police, fire, public works, and EMS personnel. And the Anoka County population is predicted to grow from 360,000 to 440,000 during the same time frame. As our communities and region are in transition, so are the public safety agencies. Law enforcement and fire agencies staff are turning over at a much higher rate than before, creating a significant experience gap. Public safety careers are still based very much on experiential learning and the ability of organizations to successfully execute our mission depends on how well we are able to train our personnel. To expect the best, we must be able to provide them the best in all areas, especially training. Currently, the nearest fixed fire training facility with live burn capabilities is the Minneapolis Emergency Operations Training Center, approximately 14 miles away. The nearest law enforcement, uh, modern law enforcement indoor fixed facility is in Maple Grove, 16 miles away. Those are travel distances from South Central Anoka County. Both of those facilities are operating at, near, or over their capacity. In addition to scheduling changes, a larger issue is the cost and logistics required to travel and train at these facilities. With these limiting factors, we often are required to find other venues to fill the gap and accomplish required training. These factors may often contribute to less time spent on critical training each year, each year with only the minimum standards met and sometimes not being able to even meet those minimum standards. A training facility where frequent realistic training can be conducted while staying within budget is desperately needed. In addition to overcome significant logistical challenges, most current training venues do not offer the level of safety, security, and consistency in creating a dynamic and high-performance training environment. The Greater Twin Cities Regional Public Safety Training Center would be the only multidiscipline facility north of I-94 in the seven county metro area and as representative kegel said the closest multidiscipline facility is in edina a new multidiscipline training facility located in oka county will serve not only local area agencies but agencies in ramsey hennepin and other areas of the region and further north in addition to serving multiple disciplines this facility will create a single training point where multiple agencies can train collaboratively for large incidents the police fire ems and public works agencies work collaborat collaboratively sorry but those sessions are often limited to once a year, if any. To best serve our stakeholders by creating a high-performing organization, a modern multidiscipline training facility is desperately needed in the North Northeast Metro. Thank you very much for your time, Chair Lee and committee, and your consideration. Representative well, Wes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Always good to see you, Chief. Thanks for presenting so well for our community. I do have one question. How much time would you estimate training one of your uh, firefighters takes in just drive time to get to these other facilities that are further away? Chief Smith. Thank you, Chair Lee. Uh, Representative West, uh, it takes about a half an hour to get all of our personnel to the training sites and back from the training site. So an hour, about an hour travel time each, each training session that we would attend uh, for the Minneapolis ETOF, for instance. Um, the greater issue is that when we train, um, we're training with probably five or six or maybe more apparatus and 20 to 30 firefighters. So it, it does present some logistics, not only with travel time, but also maintaining uh, adequate response in our home communities while we are training. Representative Wes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any closing comments, Representative Kago? Just want to thank the committee and um, both Chief Smith and Chief Podany for being here to um, support the project and hope we can get it done. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Kago. Next up, we have Representative Olson, House File 1115. Please proceed, Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So House File 1115 pertains to public safety. It asks for $6 million to build a new fire hall for the small city of Welcome. Uh, this will provide for the safety of not only citizens, but also the firefighters themselves as the building is in pretty rough shape as it is. Uh, when I was the commander of an army reserve unit, my job was to take care of soldiers. And, and now as representatives, I believe that our job is to take care of people. Uh, I don't know a single way of better doing that than to, than to allow for the, the rebuilding of a, of a fire hall that will save people's lives. You know, this, this fire hall even, they go down and they, they respond to fire calls in Iowa as well. Uh, you know, my testifier is going to show today that there, there's actually absolutely no way that the small city of Welcome will be able to afford this extremely necessary building. Um, it, it's just something that's not possible. I know that we don't generally like to fund these type of projects, 
But um, as my, my testifier, I'll turn it over. It's Jay Mulso, the first assistant fire chief of Welcome, Minnesota. He'll show you that it's just not possible. And we desperately need to make sure that people are safe. So I'll turn it over with your permission, Mr. Chair. Assistant Chief, uh, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Jay Mulso. I'm the assistant chief and welcome. Probably serving as a firefighter EMT for the last 31 years. I'd like to thank Representative Olson and also Senator Rosen for carrying this very important bill for us. A little bit about Welcome, Minnesota. Welcome's uh, a town of about 700 residents. We're located on I-90, about eight miles west of Fairmont. We have four, 24 dedicated members to our department. Uh, our coverage area is actually the city of Welcome and the surrounding rural area, which is about 72 square miles that we represent. Um, we have mutual aid agreements, which means Fairmont, for instance, has a fire, we go help them and we don't charge for our services and vice versa. They come to us if we need help. We serve that with 14 different departments as a mutual aid group. We run about 90 to 100 calls a year. Of those 70 are probably EMS or emergency medical calls and the others are all uh, fires and accident scenes, things like that. Uh, as Representative Olson said, we are not fiscally in a position where we can afford to do this on our own. Uh, we, as he alluded to, uh, initially come in as a $6.2 million budget. We come in this year to have a redo to see how it escalated, because that was a quote for 2019. It came back at 6.4 now is where we're at with this. Um, we actually did call the USDA and ask for a USDA loan, what it would be. Uh, it came back on a 30-year note at 2.25%. You're looking at over 325,000 a year payment for the city of Welcome for 30 years. In fireman's terms, that's three quarters of a fire truck every year for 30 years. We get a fire truck probably once every 20 years, just to give you a scope of what that would have to take on for the city of Welcome. They're just not fiscally able to do that. Um, our old station, currently over 50 years old, uh, it's landlocked on two sides by roads, two sides by buildings that we can uh, expand our facility. Uh, it's got mold issues in the office area. We've fixed those once and we found some more, so we're gonna have to go through that again. Uh, our kitchen actually has asbestos floor tile because it was built back in the late 60s. So we have that to go work with. Uh, we are bursting at the seams to say the least. Uh, we don't have any storage space for vehicles or for our equipment. Um, presently, we have five bays that we park trucks in. They're single deep, so we can't double stack trucks in a hall. Um, our turnout gear, our fire gear is housed along the walls of that truck area. So basically we have to get dressed next to our fire trucks. We're actually in the process right now of speccing a new rescue truck. It's 22 years old, we're buying or looking at getting a new one. We're limiting the space or the length of that truck so that it will fit in our hall. So that's another one of the things that we have to address. Um, we have one restroom, it's non-ADA compliant, uh, also uh, doubles as our storage room and also doubles as our utility room. So everything is in one, the furnace, the water software, everything is in one, one room. Um, we have no uh, exhaust system in the truck hall, meaning when we start our trucks, we'll leave them run for a couple minutes while people are getting dressed to get into the trucks to go on the fire call. That exhaust is, ex is coming out into the hall uh, when we open the doors to leave, that wind pushes that into the office area. So basically, we're all the diesel fumes we're inhaling, and it's another safety hazard that we really are, are uh, cognizant of. Concrete floors are really bad in the hall. They're 55 years old, 60 years old. They're, they're in need of work. Um, a proposed new facility, like I said, come in at 6.4. We solicited Broughton Architects out of Mankato. Uh, Corey is actually a firefighter, and he's also an architect. He came up with a space requirement for us, and uh, the building comes in at about 19,000 square feet. Uh, this uh, wrap up, please. Excuse me? Can I have you wrap up, please? Okay, uh, about 19,000 square feet. Uh, we would really appreciate uh, your consideration of this bill. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Assistant Chief. Uh, Representative Olson, any closing comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just say, you know, I think our job is absolutely to take care of people. And this bill right here and this project absolutely does that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Representative Olson. Next up, we have Representative Sandell, House File 1230. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and committee members. Thanks very much for your time this morning. 50 years ago, few people could have found Woodbury on a map. And most couldn't tell you if they'd been there. 
The city in those days had only recently been chartered in the land south of I-94 on the way to Hudson. It was mostly rolling hills, lovely oak, ash, and pine. Some farms and Bailey Nursery, now one of my neighbors. These days, Woodbury is the seventh or eighth largest city in the state, commercially bustling, proud of its schools and parks, and protective of the precious Valley Creek headwaters. The legislative district I represent, 53B, had more voters in the last election than any other legislative district in the state. Today, if you tell someone in Woodbury to meet you at the library, the Y, or Central Park, you'll both been, end up in the same place. People have been meeting at the city center campus, reading, studying, working out, living nearby, and even getting married for more than three years. We're here today because the city park needs a little growing room to make sure it's ready for the next 30 years or more. House file 1230 asks for a $15 million capital investment. That's a lot of money. And it's a significant challenge to both the city and the state. Can Woodbury continue to be a hub of business, education, and recreation to make this investment a good one? We're confident we can. Will the state be rewarded with a city that continues to respect its environment, enhance its resources, and value a place where our citizens meet and attract citizens from all over? We believe we can. I'm looking forward to an inspiring new space that's stunning to look at and invites your visit. We can do it, but we'll need a little help from our friends. My intention has been to encourage you to make this investment, but if you're not convinced yet, I brought the cleanup hitter to help win the game. It's Mayor Ann Wood, uh, it's Woodbury's Mayor Ann Burt, and she's here to clear the bases. Uh, Mayor Burt. Mayor Burt, please identify yourself and proceed. Good morning. Hi, Mayor Ann Burt here from Woodbury. Thank you, Chair Lee, and thank you, Representative Sandell. Um, um, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with this morning. I'd also like to, to thank Representative Tujong, who um, is also a representative in our Woodbury area. Joining us today is City Administrator Clint Gridley. We come before you today to request $15 million in bonding for a regional asset for the East Metro and the state of Minnesota, a place called Central Park. Central Park is a regional community gathering space and a hub of public services that serve the East Metro and the state of Minnesota. We like to say it's the most visited park in the city. It just happens to have walls around it. Unlike most city parks, it's also home to a library, an early learning and English language learner education zone, an indoor playground and recreation programming. A senior living facility and the YMCA are attached by Skyway. A large indoor garden and open amphitheater bring it all together, giving its name park and providing seating and a pleasant atmosphere for friends catching up teens who are there to study, and seniors who gather to play Mahjong. With so many services in one place, Central Park is the go-to spot for numerous suburbs and the small rural communities that are here in the eastern part of the state. Visitors travel from every corner of Minnesota for gatherings, business meetings, and special events. Health, recreation, and education services attract teens, seniors, immigrants, and families from all over the region. In fact, the library is the fifth most visited in the seven county metro area, and almost half of all the early childhood and adult learners are non Woodbury residents. When surveyed about their experiences at Central Park, visitors talk about its inclusivity, its diversity, and its sense of community. A mother who takes English as a second language class says Central Park is a place where you can go where you're very welcome, and it's so inviting. Prior to the pandemic, an international group held monthly meetings in Central Park Amphitheater, and a church group with a racially diverse congregation hosted services there every Sunday. But unfortunately, nearly 20 years have passed without significant updates since Central Park was opened in 2002. As our city and our greater community become larger, older, and more diverse, there's an increasing need to invest in this popular and well-used facility. With some help from state bonding, we hope to embrace the full potential of this facility as a regional asset by enhancing communal gathering spaces, adding 18,000 square feet of multi-purpose space capacity and improving classroom and learning environments for early childhood and adult education and English language students, we can ensure this remains a natural congregation spot and an attractive hub for many public services. In conclusion, it's a unique combination of indoor park and playground and library, learning and resources that make this facility a vibrant regional destination. By investing in these improvements to the facility, we can ensure a special sense of belonging and pride that extends to all visitors and that this popular and well-used facility remains inclusive of new identities, ideals, and needs. 
in our ever-growing and increasingly diverse regional community. We seek $15 million from the state in support of this vision. Thank you, Chair Lee. Representative Sandell, any closing comments? Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Lee. Uh, no, the uh, um, mayor did a terrific job of uh, re representing the uh, facility and the um, uh, its importance to the region. So we encourage you to um, uh, consider seriously this um, um, investment. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Sandell. Next up, we have Representative Keogh, House File 1236. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, uh, members of the committee. Um, I appreciate you hearing this bill. Uh, it is um, a small town uh, just in my east part of the district, Boston, Minnesota. They are looking to um, expand uh, the ability to house uh, all of the donations that they have gotten. Um, but I would like to ask my testifier, um, Bonnie <clears throat> Stewart, excuse me, Bonnie Stewart to uh, explain to you the project. Ms. Stewart, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning, my name is Bonnie Stewart. I am a member of the Board of Directors of the East Polk County Heritage Center. It's currently serving as its treasurer. I want to thank Representative Keel, Chair Lee, and committee members for this opportunity to describe our proposed Pine to Prairie Museum in Foston. The East Polk Heritage Center was founded in 1986 and it was established to serve five small communities on the eastern edge of Polk County, Foston, McIntosh, Erskine, Winger, and Langby. A new museum building has been a vision of EPHC since 2005. And over the past 15 years, we have uh, created a very steady but slow development process to raise money for a building that would allow us to serve our communities and the Northwest region of Minnesota. The proposed 6,700 square foot building would provide ample space for exhibits to tell the stories of our culture and our area, and to bring in relevant traveling exhibits, to provide a climate controlled environment for our collections, and to give room for performing artists and educational presentations, and to bring under one roof the many artifacts that we currently do not have the space to showcase. Our current museum is, is housed in three separate buildings, um, a historic 1880s home, an early 1900 school building, and a replica 19, early 1900s log cabin. Many of the artifacts that have been donated to us are stored in other buildings throughout our community. Uh, one example would be our original printing press from our local newspaper, The 13 Towns, that was established in 1884. It's currently in the basement of the son of the longtime publisher and owner of the newspaper. And there are many other artifacts that are in storage. Um, the museum will also house public restrooms in partnership with the city of Foston. They currently operate an aging restroom facility that is located on our proposed museum site. So we have a, just a really good close relationship with the city of Foston to make this new building a reality. Uh, we will have a research area, conference room, and uh, important to our artifacts is the uh, climate controlled archival storage area. We have uh, completed 95% of our architectural drawings. The site has been staked and we are just in need of funding. We are very appreciative for the, uh, for the opportunity to request this bonding fund. Uh, one thing we have initiated in the past several years is an outreach program with our local school district. And we have recently reached out to our neighboring Winnemac district to provide uh, cultural and artistic programming for our youth. And we, our goal is to increase our educational outreach to our elementary and high school students. With a new museum building, we would have the space to bring students to us and offer them hands-on, interactive, and memorable experiences. Uh, can you imagine the wonder of students watching that original printing press uh, as they see how it used to be done? Uh, I'm excited for that. Uh, last month, we completed a three-year strategic plan. 
Our board and planning committee members support the successful implementation of this building and we will be engaged in fundraising, membership development and partnerships to bring these resources into the organization. Uh, we have raised to date in funds and pledges of just close to $110,000. The city will be partnering with us uh, for a cost sharing in the building. The $600,000 cost estimate we received is from pre-COVID era, so we anticipate uh, those funds will be increased. But we are committed to uh, seeing the uh, completion of construction of this museum and the furnishings for this facility. Uh, we want to continue to preserve our history and culture, to educate our visitors, and to honor all of those who have contributed to who and what we are today. The Pine to Prairie Museum will serve as a cultural asset, uh, not only to Faustin, but to the surrounding communities, to the Northwest region of Minnesota, and to all visitors who come to Minnesota to visit. On behalf of my fellow board members, the city of Faustin, and most importantly, our Minnesota residents, I wanna thank you for your consideration of this bonding request. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. The Word. Uh, Representative Keo, any closing comments? Uh, uh, no, just a thank you to the committee. Uh, you chair fitfully and um, hope you'll consider this project. Thank you, Representative Keo. Next up, we have Representative Hollins, House File 1288. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I can't figure out to turn my video on. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present House File 1288 today. Um, this bill was brought to me by the St. Paul Youth Commission, and I'm excited that one of my testifiers today is from the commission. Um, just briefly, I want to share the project specifics. The North End Community Center will be a 25,000 square foot community hub offering state-of-the-art amenities to encourage social and physical activity. The center will be anchored, an anchor of the community campus with the library immediately to the south and the elementary school immediately to the west. This offers tremendous programming opportunities between partners and will be a green project that utilizes geothermal heating and cooling. This is an investment in a community that desperately needs community and athletic space. The location is about one mile to the north on Rice Street. In the service area, within two miles of the site, there are over 95,000 people living in 36,000 households. 24% of those people uh, live below the poverty level, and in a neighborhood immediately around the site, one-third of the residents are under the age of 18, and nearly two-thirds are under the age of 35. Um, this neighborhood is two-thirds BIPOC, and over half are renters. Um, and those renters often don't have a yard and use parks as an extension of their living space. The city has invested $4 million to complete the design and make this project shovel ready today. $60 million in construction funding is the only thing that we need to put the project out to bid. Um, I would like to yield most of my time to the testifier, uh, Chikamso Chijoka, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and I will turn it over to them. Uh, Council, uh, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Hi, everyone, representatives. My name is Chikamso Chidoki. Um, I am a youth commissioner for the St. Paul Youth Commission. And um, just to explain a little bit about the commission, we are a group of about 20 youth members in, this, in and around the city, and we work with um, state legislators, city hall, um, and with the community at large, our commissions. Um, tasked with tackling community issues, and we aim to help create a better St. Paul for youth and for everyone, really. Um, we practice, you know, adult youth adult partnerships to kind of get the best um, collaboration for our projects. Um, right now, we're um, going through our impact projects, which we have a lot of communication with adults. We have a lot of um, work. So we we act as representatives of youth voices in St. Paul. And one of the projects that we are working on right now is the house file um, 1288 before you the, for the North End Community Center. Um, so our commission was inspired by Council President Amy Bergmoen and her work to support the community-led and female-focused community center in the North End of the city. 
and we offered to take a lead in working with Representative Hollins and meeting with other St. Paul delegation legislators and other key elected officials. House File 1288 is critically important for our youth and for our community. This project is important from our perspective because it will provide improved access to new state-of-the-art amenities and encourage social and physical activities. There will be shared spaces that include um, multi-purpose community rooms, teaching kitchens, youth teen rooms, gym, dance, fitness rooms, and an outdoor courtyard. I mean, there are simply so many ways that this facility can and will be used. Um, and by so many people as Representative Holland's shared, you know, the, the reach. Um, for me personally, this project is very important because um, young kids and families need a place to gather and feel supported. There is a special focus on young women in sports um, in relation to this, this, is, this tennis facility, sorry, like um, Speak Tra and Badminton. I am a public high school student, so I've seen how women's sports don't really get enough attention. Um, I always remember when I played badminton and soccer, our teams never really got any fresh new equipment or new uniforms like other male-dominated sports did. So it's having a space like this for young girls in sports is really important because we have to show young girls that, you know, their activities are treated like they matter. And we as young women don't really get enough of that. So it's really important. Um, I also live in the North End, so I know firsthand how important this center would be to the community. It would serve as a place for the community to come together and to, um, yeah, the community and the youth to come together. I've lived in the North End for almost all my life, so I know how we've been wanting something like this for a very long time. Um, we need a place like this to encourage our families and our young people to encourage their fitness and their health to encourage the exploration of new hobbies and activities, a place where kids can truly be kids in a safe and healthy and nurturing environment. You know, the value that this center will create is truly priceless. Um, so I just wanna thank Representative Hollins for leading this effort and for supporting youth voices in our work. I just wanna thank um, Mr. Chair and the rest of the representatives here um, for letting me share my thoughts with you today and I, so glad to be here to ask for support in this house file. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Chijoki. Uh, Representative Hollins, any quick closing comments? Uh, thank you for the opportunity today, and I would encourage um, you know your members to support this inclusion. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Representative Hollins. Next up, we have Representative Demer, House File 1461. Please proceed, Representative Demer. Yes, Chair Lee and uh, committee members, uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, House File 1461, an exciting regional project in Scandi, Minnesota. If you're not familiar with this beautiful little community, it's located along the St. Croix River between Stillwater and Taylor's Falls, Minnesota. And historically is a home of the state's very first Swedish settlement, the Water Tower Barn Arts and Heritage Center, a joint project between Scandia, the Heritage Alliance of the city of Scandia, will be a regional center for celebrating the arts and history of the culture heritage of Scandia and will preserve what may be the only state's remaining historic tank house. Susan Rodshaw uh, is here from the Alliance and would like to share the details of the project. Thank you. Ms. Rodshaw, uh, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Chair and Rep Detmer, uh, my name is Susan Rodshaw and I'm the uh, president and the board chair of the Scandia Heritage Alliance. Um, our mayor, uh, Christine Mavsky, was not able to be with us because she's out of town, but she sends her support for the project. Um, I'm going to share some uh, slides with you about the project. So um, thank you for, for watching. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Scandia, uh, we are in the northern end of Washington County. It is a area beautiful in, uh, in, in rich in heritage. We are home of the first Swedish settlement and our beautiful Gamal Gordon Museum honors Swedish immigrant history and draws tourists from around the Twin Cities and beyond, including 3,000 international visitors, mostly from around um, Scandinavian countries. We are a perfect location for tourism, given our close proximity to the Twin Cities and regional attractions like William O'Brien State Park, the Gateway Bike Trail, and the St. Croix River. The National Park Service is seeking to designate the St. Croix River Valley as a national heritage area, which is expected to increase tourism. Our project, the Regional Water Tower Barn Arts and Heritage Center, pivots around the restored historic Water Tower Barn. This was once an iconic structure that stood in Scandia's village center behind the mercantile building. 
This historic barn played an important role in Scandia's early 20th century economy. It was built in about 1895 by the Scandia mercantile owner, Frank Lake, to provide water to local businesses and residents. It also housed horses and a wagon that traveled to the railroad station in Copas to pick up goods for the mercantile. When the building's former owner, Hilltop Water Company, decided to tear it down, we worked with them to hire a barn restoration company to carefully dismantle the structure and market for future reconstruction. We believe this building may be the state's only remaining tank house, and we are working closely with the State Historic Preservation Office to seek placement in the National Register of Historic Places. We plan to recreate and demonstrate the operational tank house. This includes showcasing the elevated wood water tank, a working windmill, and an old fashioned hand water pump where visitors can fill their water bottles. We recently received a $10,000 grant from the Minnesota Historical Society to research the original tank house history, engineering, and distinctive design. Through museum displays, we will tell the story of Scandia's evolution from Native American lands to home of the state's first Swedish immigrants to agrarian farm community, to a small center of commerce. The water tower barn was central to the development of Scandia's commercial center. It is our belief that the immigration stories we share with families and neighbors will engender compassion and unity. Like many of today's immigrants, Scandia's Swedish ancestors moved from an impoverished nation seeking a better life for their children and grandchildren. They faced extreme hardship and prejudice in the new world, but their descendants have thrived. These tales help to create understanding and draw parallels between the many shared immigrant experiences. In addition to a museum, the barn will also serve as an event center, seating 60 to 80 people for small music, theater, and film productions. We also envision holding art shows, art classes, youth day camps focused on the arts and environment, and joint events with uh, nearby cultural organizations such as the Marine Community Library, Gamelgard Museum, and the Art Barn in Osceola. An outdoor amphitheater will seat 260 people for music, theater, and film productions. No nearby communities in the St. Croix River Valley have an amphitheater, so we foresee this as a regional asset for the valley as well as for the Twin Cities as a whole. We'll also be a perfect place for our youth park and rec theater classes in the summer, and it will serve as a beautiful gathering place for residents and visitors. A water play feature will be an attraction for local families as well as those visiting William O'Brien State Park. The Gateway Trail will soon connect downtown Scandia to William O'Brien, and we will be a short bike ride away. As you can imagine, the, the, pine, the palm trees will not be part of this. Um, the Arts and Heritage Center sits between three wetlands, and our plan includes an interpretive trail that goes around and across one of the wetlands, as well as a wetland overlook. Our water focus will provide an opportunity to educate visitors on the importance and interdependence between our local wetlands lakes, streams, aquifers, and the St. Croix River, all vital features of our beautiful city. Thank you from Scandia Heritage Alliance. Our mission is to make Scandia a uniquely interesting and vibrant place to live in and visit by preserving and celebrating our rich history, culture, arts, and rural character. This is our primary project as it fits so perfectly with our mission. Um, we look forward to seeing all of you at the Arts and Heritage Center. Um, we really appreciate your support for House File 1461. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rosho, uh, Representative Demmer, any quick closing comments? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, Scandia area is, is one of my favorite places to uh, take grandkids. And, uh, and also when I was an educator, I brought my uh, students to the uh, Scandia area with the uh, park there with the orienteering courses and so forth. So it's a great uh, regional center and uh, hope that we have your support. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Denver. Next up is Representative Munson, House File 1415. Please proceed. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the committee. Um, this, uh, this request is for $375,000 for re repairing the roof, um, the HVAC system, and flooring for the Lake Crystal Area Rec Center. Um, testifying today is uh, the Executive Director of the Rec Center, Ryan Yunkers. And uh, we'll also have the Lake Crystal City Administrator, uh, Taylor Grono, that will be available for questions. So I can uh, kick it over to Ryan. Mr. Yonkers, please identify yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Lee, Representative Munson and committee members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of the City of Lake Crystal and the Lake Crystal Area Recreation Center. Uh, my name is Ryan Yonkers. I'm in my ninth year serving as the Executive Director of the Center. Um, about 22 years ago, this very body appropriated $1.5 million towards about the $4.5 million construction of a proposed 
community serving recreation, aquatics, senior wellness center to serve South Central Minnesota. Uh, thanks to that funding, uh, rigorous fundraising and city investment, the LCARC was built. Uh, since opening, the center averages over 4,000 unique visits monthly. Um, we provide everything from swimming lessons to senior events, wellness fairs to blood drives. We partner with local hospitals, uh, three local hospitals to provide physical therapy, on-site vaccine clinics, nutrition education, and more. Uh, we partner with local nonprofits to provide scholarships so that everybody, regardless of ability to pay, uh, can utilize the services at the rec center. Um, between grant writing, donations, program income, and a substantial annual support from the city of Lake Crystal and Blue Earth County, uh, you will note that we've been able to successfully operate this facility for over 20 years. However, there are some large expensive 20 year capital projects which now must be addressed. Um, the roof is now constantly leaking, has been patched repeatedly. Uh, it's at its end of its life. Uh, the main pool HVAC unit is now obsolete and if it goes down, we are shut down. Um, and the pool deck flooring has to be addressed to bring it up to code. Altogether, we've identified over $1.1 million in um, capital uh, significant urgent projects. And as Representative Munson said, our ask is 375 of that. Um, although we serve the region, these capital projects would represent a significant uh, financial burden on the city of Lake Crystal directly. Uh, I ask is 375,000. The City of Lake Crystal, Lake Crystal Area Recreation Center are committed to covering the rest of these project costs. I know that this is one of the tasks that you'll hear today, you know, you've heard in the danger in that, um, is it can get lost in the shuffle. You know, they're only asking for 375. Um, but to us, it makes a significant difference. I truly believe like this is a strong model for future projects or projects like this where the state provides some uh, upfront funding to get the project like this off the ground. The community supports it operationally for decades. And then maybe the group comes back once for a 20 year request. Uh, the need is now more urgent than ever. And I ask for your support. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yonkers. Representative Erdahl. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Lee. And uh, Representative Munson, uh, you know, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to comment on your project last week, uh, but I thought that you should have the same opportunity that uh, we did afford Representative Dreskowski. Uh, you know, we, we have, Representative Munson, we have many members that are new to bonding and new to this committee. Now, would you please explain to them as a, as a experienced member that you are, uh, why bonding for projects like this is so important to small towns like Lake Crystal? Representative Munson. Yeah, uh, thank you, Representative Verdal, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, well, it's, uh, you know, projects like this are important for the, because they serve the community. I think this project specifically is unique because um, the schools in the region also use the facilities here. Um, our local schools don't have swimming pools, so they uh, do swimming class, uh, we use the pools. My daughters play uh, basketball in these courts in the rec center here because the school's uh, courts are limited. Um, so it's a it's uh, it's more than just um, an area for the for the community, but it's also used by the schools. And uh, so that's why it was uh, this, this project's important. Last follow up, Representative Erdahl. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Representative Munson. And just a quick one of uh, uh, Mr. Blues Yonkers. Uh, mm -hmm. um, if this project, if, if this were not funded, uh, if the state help you with this project, uh, how would it be paid to uh, raise local property taxes to do it so? Mr. Yonkers. Um, and I'll, I'll invite our city administrator if he wants to chime on, uh, in on this as well. Uh, I think what we would need to do is sit down and, and prioritize what we have to have to get done this year um, and work that out. Um, you know, we've got uh, um, some projects identified that just have to get done this year. Um, I guess we'd go back to the we go back to the table and, and kind of figure out how we would uh, fund these projects. And I'll defer to uh, our Administrator uh, Gronau if he wants to add anything. Uh, City Administrator, do you want to add a quick comment to Representative Erdahl's question? Please identify yourself. 
Thank you, Chair Lee, and uh, thank you, Representative Erdahl. Uh, my name is Taylor Groen. I'm the City Administrator with the City of Lake Crystal. Um, if the projects, if we do not receive state funding for this project, the city would likely need to um, issue debt and bond, um, which would um, in, which would have an impact on the property tax uh, levy here in the City of Lake Crystal. Thank you. Representative Monson, any quick closing? Um, you no, know, I mean, you can see the from the photo behind me here The I mean, the facility is uh, it's a wonderful facility. It's used by everybody, uh, many, most people in the community. And uh, um, I understand that uh, not every city gets to have a, a rec center this beautiful, but um, we, we hope to, to get funding either locally or through the state. And I appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Representative Munson. Next up, we have Representative Kreeshaw, House File 1867. Please proceed. Uh, Representative Krisha, you're on mute right now. That was a great speech, Mr. Chair. I'm so sorry. Um, Mr. Chair, I will be brief and turn this over to my the executive director for the museum so I can respect your time. Um, executive Director Mary Warner, please go ahead with your project. Uh, Ms. Warner, please identify yourself and proceed. I'm Mary Warner, Executive Director from the Morrison County Historical Society. Uh, good morning, uh, Representative Lee and other committee members, and thank you for this opportunity to testify regarding House File 1867 uh, that was submitted by Representative Cresha. Um, the Charles A. Warehouser Memorial Museum, home of the Morrison County Historical Society Falls, Minnesota, sits atop a high bank of the Mississippi River overlooking the confluence of Pike Creek. It is an idyllic natural setting that is deeply important to Native people, but there's a problem. Severe erosion undercutting the Mississippi River bank is threatening the museum, which sits only 20 feet from the upper edge of the bank. It's gotten worse since last March when we were due to testify and the pandemic shut down the legislature. A storm at the end of June dropped eight inches of rain in six hours and caused a massive portion of the shoreline to shear off, as well as causing a mudslide at the Lindbergh House and Museum next door and erosion along Pike Creek and Lindbergh State Park across the street. In seeking assistance from the county to handle the erosion, we were told that our site was ineligible because we are a private nonprofit and not yet on the National Register of Historic Places. While we did receive assistance from the Morrison County Soil and Water Conservation District to construct a low berm at the top of the bank to prevent water from running off, this does not solve the problem of erosion being caused by the action of the river or massive rainfalls. The Morrison County Historical Society has been told that if the Pike Creek Bridge, which can be seen from the museum, was being threatened with erosion of this magnitude, state agencies would jump in to fix the problem because the bridge is infrastructure. Having worked in public history for over 24 years, I can tell you that history is as much a part of the community's infrastructure as the bridge. The, the Warehouser Museum holds tens of thousands of items in its collections with billions of points of data that form the web of Morrison County's historical and cultural infrastructure. This data has been used directly for community and economic development, historic preservation, and forging family connections. The museum building itself was designed to be an artifact that not only serves as a protective envelope for the collections inside, but tells the story of the county through its form and materials. It was designed by noted architect Foster Dunwitty, one of the founders of Miller Dunwitty, which worked on the state capital restoration projects. So we've got a connection. Due to the Warehouser Museum's design and importance as part of the county's history infrastructure and the significance of the museum site to the native people, the Morrison County Historical Society plans to nominate it to the National Register of Historic Places when the museum becomes eligible in 2025. At over 45 years of age, the building is in need of a number of capital improvements so that it can maintain its unique character and continue serving as part of Morrison County's history infrastructure. Improvements include replacing the HVAC system, replacing rotting doors and siding, bringing the entries and restrooms up to current ADA code, replacing the cedar shingle roof, installing mobile shelving and other storage components to increase the museum's collections capacity, removing an underground fuel tank, and performing maintenance on the specially designed gazebo that overlooks the Mississippi River. We have been diligently seeking funding for a number of these projects through donations from members, grants, and a Region 5 CARES Act loan. We are also finding creative solutions to some projects, like having a crew from Northern Bedrock 
Historic Preservation Corps paint a portion of the museum last summer, providing a training experience through one of our improvement projects. However, all of these improvements will be jeopardized if the riverbank continues to erode and threatens the museum structure. An appropriation from the state legislature will help us repair the erosion along with improving and incre increasing the capacity of the Weyerhaeuser Museum to preserve Morrison County's history into the future. Thank you for considering this investment in Morrison County's history infrastructure, and we do hope that we will see you on the summer bonding tour. Thank you, Ms. Warner. Uh, Representative Kreshaw, any closing comments? Uh, the only thing I would leave with is uh, Executive Director Warner and her staff uh, of volunteers and uh, have done a fantastic job. It's a great asset. Um, it's, it's very core to what we do in Morrison County and, and part of our resources. So I would ask for your support. Hope you can make the bonding tour uh, as part of your priority. And if there's any questions, I'm open for those. Uh, we don't have any questions. So thank you, Representative Kreshaw. Next up, we have uh, Chair Nelson, House File 708. Please proceed. Chair Nelson, you're on mute right now. I mute myself here. Sorry about that. We're jumping back and forth between my committee and yours. Um, House File 708 is a proposal to appropriate bonding money for North Hennepin Community College. Um, it has to do with replacing their fine arts building now that they've really outgrown. They're actually a fine arts center as part of one of their other buildings and building a new center for innovation and in the arts uh, just north of the college, across the road from the college and on land that they own next to the new Hennepin County Library. And you so you got the, the, the picture up there. Um, this is in cooperation with the city of Brooklyn Park, uh, the local school district, the Osseo School District, plus the other school districts around, plus the other areas. Um, the cities around here have expressed support for this also. Um, it's, it's a way to bring the community in, and bring arts in the community. And I think we have the uh, um, the, the president from the, uh, the college was going to be on the call. I don't, I don't know if he is or not. Yes, I am. Dr. Garcia, please identify yourself and proceed. Absolutely. Uh, I'm Dr. Rolando Garcia. I'm president of North Hennepin Community College, a member of Minnesota State. Thank you, Chair Lee, Representative Nelson, for the opportunity to talk about the Center for Innovation and the Arts. Um, so Representative Nelson mentioned that this is a partnership project and uh, right now we are currently working with um, North Hennepin Community College, Hennepin County, the Osseo School District, Brooklyn Park and many more. Uh, we do have an advisory committee which does include folks from the surrounding school districts and cities um, for this project. The building itself is an 83,000 square foot building which will bring arts and innovation to the Northwest Metro. Uh, on the screen, you're seeing the multidisciplinary arts centers around the Twin Cities, and you'll notice that the Northwest um, Metro does not have a facility. And so we are looking to be that facility for the region. It is a very diverse community, about half a million um, mem members of, uh, of the Twin Cities live within 10 miles of the center. And 37% of those are people of color, and 14% of them are, are from uh, another country. And as you get closer to the college, um, you'll see that out of the 9,100 students we currently serve, 49% of the students are of color, 33% are low income, and 61% are first generation in their family to go to college. What you're seeing here is some of the design work. Um, you're seeing here some flexible performance space that we've looked at. Um, active learning classrooms, workshops, studios, large rehearsals. This is to replace our current aging facility. What you also see on here is a possible future magnet school, which would be a phase two of the project, and this would be with the school district. And this is the second level, same thing, more, more specialized space, active learning classrooms, and recital space. The, this space will be mixed use. It would be used by the college for delivery of our courses and our programming and also uh, partner, partners in terms of delivering community um, education in those areas. So this is an example of a space, a flexible performance theater. Uh, you can see how it can be rearranged and used 
differently. And then this is a snapshot of our active learning classrooms to support um, STEAM education. And that would also be in this building. For the city of Brooklyn Park, uh, this is an opportunity to offer cross-cultural programming for all ages. Um, it's a partnership opportunity with the neighboring communities to be able to deliver that type of programming for everyone in the region. It would also be the anchor and focal point for equitable economic development. Um, in the area, there is a light rail train station that will be uh, set up right across the street from the college. So this would be a stop where folks can take the light rail and come to the center as well as come to the college and take courses. And obviously there's an opportunity for workforce development. Um, a lot of the training that we will do will lead towards jobs in the creative sector. Uh, the creative sector in the Twin Cities accounts for about, has about a $1.8 billion impact. And there are about 66,000 jobs in the, uh, in the region. For Hennepin County, this is an opportunity to provide um, a wider patronage, uh, more services uh, within the new library that they have there. It also supports an economic development in the region. Uh, the center will be an amazing amenity for folks who live and work in the Northwest Metro. And then for the college, it's an opportunity for us to replace our aging facility, not in a standard way, but as a way that we are partnering um, to make something that's audacious and big and serves the needs of a larger community. And uh, it will help create a pipeline for the creative sector. The dream would be the school districts would feed right into North Hennepin and we are partnering with universities to be able to deliver the baccalaureate right on site. So folks who live in the region won't have to necessarily travel. They can go right from high school to community college and right to the university and uh, obtain their degrees right here without going anywhere. For Osseo, um, they sir, are- going... yeah, Can I have you uh, wrap up, please? Yes, sir. For Osseo, it's, an, it's uh, really addressing the space need that they have. And um, as I mentioned, there's already work that's been done, feasibility studies, pre-design. And this is a project that was designated in the capital program for Minnesota State. And um, like I mentioned, we have not been idle in the years leading up to this. There's been a lot of work that's already been done and we need your support to be able to start the, um, the design and construction process for this project. Uh, the city is, is in for $8 million. Our partners um, through either direct contribution or fundraising will raise another 32 million. So the, that kind of summarizes where we are with the project. We will welcome any additional questions. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Uh, Chair Nelson, any closing comments? You're on mute right now, Chair Nelson. Again, thank you members for listening to this. This is a good project. It's, it'll bring in um, from the, the whole community. It has community buy-in from, like I said, from the city, the county, the school board, as well as the college. And it's, so it's a cooperative project that'll be a well-used building when we get it built. Thank you members for listening. Thank you, Chair Nelson. Next up, Representative Frederick, House File 394. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, House File 394 is a bonding request for uh, Minnesota State University Mankato. MSU Mankato is a comprehensive university with more than 14,000 students enrolled in the fall of 2020. Uh, it is the largest university in Minnesota State system and second largest university in Minnesota. Uh, currently ranking 12th nationally amongst master's institutions in international student enrollment. Uh, MSU Mankato has approximately 1,200 international students from more than 90 countries. Uh, the university offer, also offers more than 130 undergraduate programs of study, including 13 pre-professional programs and more than 85 graduate programs, including master specialist and other doctoral programs. Uh, the bulk of this work on this campus happens in uh, Armstrong Hall. Armstrong Hall is the largest lecture hall in the uh, on the campus uh, where the majority of the work and the, the uh, education uh, happens. It was built back in 1964. It has been used heavily uh, throughout the years and it is time that it gets um, updated and uh, here to speak to that extent uh, is uh, turned over to my testifier. Uh, Mr. Corcoran, please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Paul Corcoran. I'm the Assistant Vice President for uh, Minnesota of Facilities Management at Minnesota State 
uh, Mankato, East State University of Mankato. Um, thank you, uh, Representative Lee and, and the entire committee um, and Representative Frederick for support in the past and hearing this bill. Um, our request is to uh, replace the academic building known as Armstrong Hall. Um, as uh, as Frederick, Representative Frederick let you know, it was constructed in 19... 64 uh, and has really been known as the academic workhorse of the campus. Uh, it's a very large building at 144,000 square feet and contains nearly half of all our general lecture classrooms on campus. Uh, building houses three colleges, three of the seven colleges here at MSU, 24 different academic departments and is, is very heavily used. Uh, it's likely uh, that just about any, every student that's ever attended MSU uh, since the mid 60s has probably taken at least a class in Armstrong Hall or more. So there's a tremendous student impact on this building. The building is, is now completely worn out, a large drain on our resources and uh, by student survey is the least desired learning space on campus. Um, so this, this 2021 request is to move forward essentially with our 2020 request that was uh, unfortunately not funded to uh, design and construct a new and smaller building uh, along with partial renovations and several other buildings to allow the uh, uh, demolition of Armstrong Hall. Uh, as I said, this is the, the same scope um, and program as the 2020 request. The campus is committed to this scope and program and uh, we would like to advance it. The current request has been really very well researched and a very deliberate. Um, other options uh, have been thoroughly investigated. In 2016, we looked at the uh, concept of uh, building an addition to the building and then going through and renovating the existing space in phases. Um, let's say that that was just viewed as adding too many square feet and far too expensive. And so it was never advanced to the legislature. Uh, in 2018, uh, we pivoted and proposed to renew the existing Armstrong Hall. Um, this, uh, it was still quite expensive. I would say it's in the neighborhood of $60 million in today's construction dollars. And really the, the challenges were the end result would never meet the state's new building uh, guidelines, B3 and sustainable building guidelines for energy efficiency or quality of indoor environment. So. Uh, along with the long logistics of trying to continue campus operations while taking 50% of our learning spaces offline, uh, the results uh, were that uh, it was, uh, we just couldn't justify spending that amount of money and then the end result being something that everybody's more or less told us they really don't like. So current request now is to build a new smaller building. Uh, the new uh, building would be 44,000 uh, less square feet, so that's a net reduction of our campus uh, square footage. Um, obviously, we'll provide those new learning spaces, uh, modern, flexible. Uh, we uh, we uh, have a, included a variety of different officing options to increase space use efficiency. Uh, we consolidate apartments, bring them all back together uh, for uh, additional space uh, efficiencies. Um, we create a number of informal learning spaces. This current building has has no sp no space for uh, informal learning now. Uh, these these informal learning spaces are very important to students nowadays. Uh, the way to the classes classes are taught, including uh, project uh, based learning, um, uh, make these informal learning spaces essential. And then uh, state of Minnesota B three and sustainable standards will be followed, which also includes. Uh, a focus on indoor environment quality. So we, we will address all those things. One of the important things I wanna stress is that we're also incorporating some bold initiatives um, in space use efficiency and academic sustainability. Some things we've already done like a common bell. Uh, we had uh, classes overlapping others. So we've already implemented that that uh, allows students to uh, uh, be able to graduate on time because they can get classes. Um, and Order, can I have you wrap up, please? Okay. Um, so in closing, uh, I just want to say on behalf of the news, I want to thank you for your time. Completion of the project will set new standards in space use of efficiency. We would like to be the model 
uh, for the system and uh, advancing this project will help us be that model, show people that what can be done and how to do it. Thank you, Mr. Corcoran. Uh, Representative Frederick, any quick closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Um, I appreciate any support that you have for this project. Uh, it has been many, many years in the making. I personally can attest the need of these upgrades as I have spent uh, many years in that building uh, when I was going to school there. So uh, again, I appreciate any support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Frederick. Uh, last bill on the agenda is Representative Hewitt, House File 2227 with the Minnesota Zoo. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. First of all, I wanna thank you very much for ones that were on the committee last year. Um, as you know, you did a major investment in the Minnesota Zoo, and that will be underway here shortly. I'm not going to take much time presenting this because I know I am not the star here today. Um, it sounds like we're going to see Mr. Porcupine again today. Um, but anyways, the overall ask is $24 million. I'm going to let them explain that to you. And right now, I believe we have Mr. McDermott and Ms. Grace to talk to us about Mr. Porcupine. Uh, please proceed. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. This is Chimba and Taryn. Chimba is a member, and Taryn, a member of our animal ambassador team here at the Minnesota Zoo, which co consists of the three departments that maybe others previously know pre-COVID as Bird Show, Close Encounters, and Zoo Mobile Program. And what this program is meant to do is give unique, impactful interactions with the public, um, all ages, to help promote conservation and caring for wildlife and giving these up close and personal interactions with, with the guests uh, is something that, the, that will help people remember and want to help conserve, the, conserve our natural habitat. And Shimba here, she is from Africa and she is in Africa she conservation she would live in forests savannas deserts all around those ranges and she, not being from Minnesota it's still um, meet, being able to meet the public gives the public appreciation for wildlife and then looks at the animals that are around our areas and in these programs that we offer the public will learn where the we are trainers, but we're also educators. They'll learn how to interact with wildlife and interacting with wildlife and coexisting is such a huge topic and a huge priority for Minnesota and all over the world right now and always. And these unique opportunities are possible because of the training that we do with these animals. These are the rock stars. Uh, these are the main um, stars of our of our program and right now we're in need of all three areas are in need of help with their homes because we with as we progress we have uh they were in need of renovation in some of the bird show areas and also the zoo mobile areas you maybe even your kids maybe have seen some of the programs with the zoo mobile team and their areas are in need of upgrades just with any with every facility, as we're talking about that, we need these the time to to have those um, upgrades made for for these animals, uh, like Chimba. And Chimba is one of, as I said, she's probably one of our main rock stars here. And she, you may have seen her in the Close Encounters department um, before. And we, since COVID, we've been working hard to maintain these relationships so we can provide these impactful moments with our public when, since we now are reopened and starting programs. Um, Chimba here, we've maintained our relationship. We've kept her healthy. We've kept her engaged mentally and physically. <laughs> and she's coming there to see you. So she she is uh, one of the our animal ambassadors here. And one of the main reasons we need to improve um, those homes just because we're the natural wear and tear, but also just those um, improvements that are needed to provide all the, the best care possible, the world-class care that, that we have here at the Minnesota Zoo. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a look at, at Chimba here. She is the largest uh, member of the porcupine family. Again, she is from Africa. That's where they're native to. And you can check out these quills. These are... Uh, uh, these porcupines have been known to fight off lions. They have really strong quills in the back that will open up completely, kind of like um, all the way forward to the front of her head when she is threatened. And 
she can defend herself against lions. But naturally what they're gonna do out there is forage on roots, vegetables, fruits, uh, anything that she can dig up, they're great diggers. And then she, they, what they do for their environment out there in the forest and savannas is they're, they're pretty good seed dispersers. So they'll eat the fruits and then spread the seeds around. And these are the type of, um, type of benefits that we, we teach in our programs to the children. So they understand that even though Chimbe here doesn't live in Minnesota, we have the same similar animals um, like the North American porcupine and other animals that do those same jobs that are so important for our, to preserve our, our habitats around, around Minnesota, but all around the world as well. And I'm gonna send it back to you. I'll give you one more close up of Chimbo who is turning 10 this year, who's lived at the Minnesota pretty much her entire life. So Ms. Grace, can I have you identify yourself for the record, please? Um, Tara Grace, I am the uh, zoologist of the animal ambassador team here at the Minnesota Zoo. Thank you, Ms. Grace. Uh, Representative Abaje, you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, the question is for Ms. Grace. If she can just specify the region where the animal comes from. Um, it's so beautiful, so I just want to know specifically what region it comes from. Ms. Grace. Yes, the region is in in um, in Africa, in the northern region of Africa. Again, she can. They are found in the forest, the uh, savannas, and the desert areas. So they can travel in all those um, different different areas. Thank you, Thank Ms. you Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Frawley, the next three minutes is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you for allowing us to. Uh, have Tara and Taryn and Chimba join. I really appreciate that. And thank you, uh, Rep. Hewitt. Uh, Mr. Chair and community members, my name is John Frawley, Director of the Minnesota Zoo. Uh, just a, a reminder, the Minnesota Zoo's mission is to connect people to animals like we just did and the natural world to save wildlife. 42-year-old uh, zoo opened in 1978. We are a state zoo. Uh, we have 500 acres zoo. We're the fifth largest zoo in the country, over 5,000 animals and 1.3 billion guests. Um, as we previously um, you know, requested over the years, our bonding request continues to focus on just revitalizing this amazing 42-year-old campus. Uh, our request includes renovating a 44-year-old uh, a vet hospital, which was built before the zoo was built for $5 million, uh, reopening our nocturnal trail, which has been closed for over 10 years uh, for $4 million, and a project that recently moved up to the top of our list the Lakeside Plaza on our main lake is crumbling and deteriorating. That without other asset preservation, um, we have a $15 million request for a total of 24 million. You know, our vet hospital, you know, we have an amazing vet staff over, you know, we're building three vet staff with three vet techs, um, but we don't have the cutting edge facility to go with the, with, the, with the vet staff. And we have so many animals from all over the world that we care for. Um, this our 44 year old building is just not keeping up an example here is uh, of a unique species we have sea otters here in minnesota in our zoo and this uh, this animal rocky had to have a flipper uh, amputated and you know it was just a struggle of not being able to have the right equipment to, to perform these but these are the types of procedures that happen every day at the minnesota zoo um, our our animal hospital uh, surgery room doubles as an intensive care unit um, which means when our, you know, our staff having to move critical patients out of surgery and into hallways and so forth to be able to care for the animals. Uh, another unique animal, a, a fruit bat here. Our treat, treatment room uh, is, is the original treatment room. Uh, here's a red panda, Min, who uh, had a tooth problem. And you know, when these types of things happen, we do not have the dental equipment or the dental you know, needs to be able to do this. So we have to reach out and we're using and borrowing equipment from other vet facilities. And all of that it costs time and, and money. And um, for a state of the art zoo like us, we need to uh, need to take these and bring this up to, up to current standards. You know, lastly, in the vet hospital, I mean, I think everybody can realize one of the biggest challenges we have is a vet hospital in the middle of winter when we have animals from all over the world this is our loading dock. This is how animals come in and out of the vet hospital. Um, you can imagine that at 10, 10, 20.
the animals have to go outside before they get in. And, and uh, when you have sick animals, it's you know something we really need to address. Plus our ambulances are all outside and frozen. Um, we can't put anything in the ambulances because it would freeze. So this request uh, helps us add a ambulance port onto our building. The building Raleigh, can I have you wrap up, please? Yep. Our nocturnal trail is uh, 10 years old, so we will be renovating that. Um, it's a $4 million project. And then, and then the main lake at the zoo is uh, has a 45 infrastructure project that you can see here has a few photos that we've repaired once and has failed. And now our engineers are telling us we need to repair this. Uh, this is a major project that we'll be bringing in front of the committee in, in future meetings. Thank you, Dr. Frawley, uh, Director Frawley. And members, uh, that concludes our agenda for today. I just wanna say thank you all for your participation in the 22 uh, capital investment hearings that we have since uh, we began session in January. I hope you all have a good break. Uh, this meeting is adjourned.